Hey everyone, this is Catalin, and in today's episode, uh, we're going to talk with uh, Dr. Yanir Baryam. Uh, he's a professor and president at New England Compass System Institute, and he has advised the Pentagon about global social unrest, the crisis of uh, Egypt and Syria, the National Security Council, Na National Counterterrorism Council, and many, many others. He's also author uh, of uh, two books uh, and many, many research papers on complex systems that we're going to have links on. And uh, he has been of particular uh, impact to me as I've uh, been working with a lot of people on trying to figure out how, uh, how we, as, um, we as a group we can tackle the, the problems that we are facing from health healthcare to the way we're organizing ourselves politically uh, to education and many, many other problems that we're currently facing. It seems like the current ways of, of, of the way we're doing things are not working. Uh, so I've taken an incredible joy in, in reading uh, his and the, the nonprofit that he's running's work, uh, and I hope you will do too. Uh, we talked about uh, some specific examples. Uh, we've talked about uh, the current uh, epidemic, let's say, that's going on that started in, in China. We talked about that and kind of um, how that works as well as other topics. So if you're a business person, if you're a policy person, if you're looking to understand more about how we can, as a group, tackle the problems of tomorrow, I think this is going to be very insightful. So hope you will enjoy it, and we're going to have links for everything we're going to have in this conversation so you can learn more about it. Thank you so much. Enjoy the conversation. So Yanir, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to have the conversation. I guess what would be an interesting thing to start is, from your perspective, looking at the world now, we have so many things uh, going on. What do you think is the state of the world in terms of the problems that we're currently facing and the th things that are currently undergoing? And, and then we'll talk about how can understanding complex systems and science help us with that. So there are several different aspects. One is that we have increasing global connectivity and that's leading to uh, large scale catastrophic events that can happen. Um, uh, we saw that, of course, with the financial crisis. We see that almost on a daily or weekly or monthly basis with events that happen that are affecting the entire world. Um, and um, the part of the, related to that somewhat as well as to other things, the, just the complexity of what's going on is increasing. And that's straining uh, the organizational structures that we have to respond to it. So um, uh, companies are under stress, but also public sector organizations are particularly under stress, whether it's healthcare and dealing with healthcare issues or education, but also governance is having a tremendous challenge in dealing with the crises and the challenges of what's going on in the world. Um, so that's. Uh, a major part of the sort of the challenges that we're facing. Um, there is a, a, a underlying a transformation that is taking place uh, which has to do with the shift from national uh, dominance of the power of nations um, to uh, the existence of sort of global forces uh, but also uh, quite interestingly, there's also a shift towards more local, a demand for more local control um, and uh, diversification of what's happening at the local level. Mm. So all of these uh, forces are affecting um, and being affected by how people interact with each other. Um, and um, uh, structurally, the organizations that are failing uh, rapidly are sort of traditional hierarchical organizations. Um, and uh, what is arising in their place is a lot more distributed control. Uh, but in the interim and sort of as part of this, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, dictatorships, if you will, coming into, into prominence. Uh, but this is somehow ironically as part of this uh, shift towards a need for more distributed control organizations. That's a lot that I've said right there. Maybe you would yeah. like to unpack it a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, and what are the current effects that you see, like in terms of specific uh, cases? Because we're looking at 
um, let's say, the 10, well, well uh, the, so, some of the biggest problems that we're currently facing from the food crisis to education to uh, health and things like things of that nature. You're saying that um, because of these flaws in the current way we're running things, those are uh, more and more uh, getting out of our grip. grip. Right, right. Um, so can you detail a little bit more on uh, what is um, what are the core fundamental problems with the okay. current way we're, we're doing things? So um, today as we are now involved in, the, um, in responding to the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, starting in Wuhan, um, what we see is sort of the global uh, connectivity and how that creates global crises uh, and the need for rapid response uh, and maybe even changes in the structure of how we deal with transportation systems or health systems and how they respond to things. Um, that's one type of challenge. Um, another uh, very different type of challenge is just the, um, in the health domain is the uh, challenge of responding to the tremendous uh, complexity of, of cases that show up in a doctor's office or in a hospital. Um, the systems that we have designed for doing so um, are um, not yet well adapted to the increasing knowledge that we have about how to deal with many different cases. So I imagine that over the past, right, which is true over the past 50 years, we've learned a lot about medicine, how to deal with many different cases. As we learn more and more different cases, um, physicians have to make much more carefully refined decisions. There are many more medications and figuring out which medication to provide for a particular case or different nuances in you know, how to deal with hand problems or, mm -hmm. or, or, or subtleties. So what's happened is that there is an explosion of specialization, um, which is a response to increasing complexity. But as the complexity increases exponentially, if you will, depends on what, how you measure it, um, but as it increases very rapidly, the organizational structures that we have are not capable of dealing with that increase in complexity. And that's the, 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 the greatest stress that, um, that people are experiencing because as, peop as members of or as workers in organizations, um, the complexity of what they have to deal with is increasing. And that's what we call stress and burnout and all of these things. So as an example, uh, recently, um, it's been declared that burnout is a medical condition, and of mm -hmm. course, one of the um, uh, professions that is experiencing a lot of burnout are physicians. Um, and um, so the question is, how do we structurally deal with that problem? Because ascribing it as a medical condition makes you believe that it's a condition of the individual but it's actually a condition of the system that uh, physicians and other uh, uh, people are part of. So the biggest challenge is not to treat the individual, but to understand how to treat the systems, the organizations, the societies that we are part of. Yeah, and would you say um, it feels to me, especially in the last 20 years, um, as Mark Andreessen, uh, one of the founders of one of the biggest venture capital funds in Silicon Valley famously said that software is eating the world. That's one of the things that has been, the world has been focusing on a lot in the mm -hmm. last, let's say, 20 years. Um, but a CRM is not a complex problem. Um, mm -hmm. All these things that people have been figuring out, um, they're all relatively simple things, more or less. Right. And I'm not saying software is simple, but there's, and that generalizes to other domains. Would you say we've exhausted simple problems and we now need to come up with this new well, way of thinking about solving these new things and we're trying to take the same hammer we've used to um, solve those things and try try with this new set of problems that are, they don't behave anything like the ones right. we've dealt before. Do you think we're at that moment? 
generally speaking, or? Yes, in a sense. So we okay. are uh, indeed part of the challenge is to realize that the old style of problems and the old style of solutions doesn't apply mm -hmm. um, to what we're dealing with. The, it, one can say that software, certain software, simplifies what we do. Like nowadays, instead of pulling out a map and looking where you're going on the road, you have GPS that tells you exactly how, where to turn and, and, and how to get there. It simplifies your uh, task. But where the complexity comes from is from the society, from the nature of social interactions. And the challenges of all of the different uh, ways we're interacting with each other and how we're working together is creating a tremendous new uh, complexity. Ironically, that's also the way we have to solve the problem, which is that we have to develop relationships in a way that enable us to work collectively uh, in order to address complexity. Um, the old style approach to solving the problem was if you have a difficulty, you put someone in charge. Uh, nowadays, increasingly, people realize that that's not the solution. Why is that not the solution? Because the complexity of any individual is bounded, is limited. And the nature of the transition that we're going through is that the complexity of society has become greater than the complexity an individual can deal with. Hmm. And, and that's actually one of the later topics I want to address. There's this um, uh, one article in the news, Society is too complicated to have a president uh, 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 by Jason uh, Kobler, if I'm spelling that correctly, right. I hope. Um, th that's very, very interesting. But it, how can, okay, so I think this might be a good time to um, maybe uh, lay out some of the Correct. Like, how, how do we realize we're dealing with a complex system or with a complex problem? What are the, some, of, some of the characteristics that we can realize we're dealing with that? So, the, tr the way I think about the problem actually has to do with some mathematical ideas, but they translate into um, conceptual properties of systems. Um, the mathematical ideas are the basis of statistics, which assumes that the elements of a system are sufficiently independent that the average behavior of the system is a simple view that captures the behavior of the system as mm -hmm. a whole. Um, when elements are not independent, then you can imagine that they move together and their movement is then affecting not only the average behavior of the system, but it affects whether the average is even a good quality to talk about, hmm. right? Because if, you know, if people are kind of doing arbitrary things, then the average is simple. But if all of a sudden everybody starts moving in the same direction, then the average is not well behaved, but also it's not a good description of mm -hmm. what's happening in the system. So if half of the people move this way, half of the people move that way, then the average is not a good description. And that's something that happens, not necessarily physically, but in terms of how people, people's opinions. So if you have polarization in a society, then the average of Doesn't what people matter. think is not what's important. It's, what's important is that you have two different groups Mm -hmm. that are really thinking about and, and saying different things. And um, with, all this, um, with all this complexity that's going on, as you just described, what is, if I would have, let's say, if I would have a business where I would be a position of, in a, I would be a person in a, posi a position of policy, or whatever it is I'm doing, um, it seems, it's, it's not obvious to me what I can start doing or learning about so I can, in a, in a way, try to take the current system and move it. It seems like a completely different paradigm. Yes. Would you say it's, it's useful to marginally improve the current systems we have or do we need, like you have, uh, for example, um, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations that's empowered by, by blockchain, that it seems to allow a lot of the ideas that you're proposing. 
uh, and that's not a marginal improvement. It's no, a whole it's new a thing. dramatic change. So, so. Would, you, would you say it's useful to start looking at ways we can improve our current systems or there's maybe a lot more benefit to try to come up with, with new ways from scratch that, that mirror the way so our the, environment... So the, the answer is somehow both. Okay. Um, the point is that there is a radical transformation going on but we cannot just go there. We have to somehow go there in steps um, because um, it's not possible to somehow intuit what is the right final system. And that also applies, by the way, to technologies that mm -hmm. are trying to help with this uh, in some sense or provide opportunities to make changes. Um, we still it's still a social system transformation, not a technology change, mm -hmm. um, though technologies clearly are facilitating sure. the changes that are taking place. Um, so uh, it, it's a both and statement. So we have to increment incrementally change, but the change is a rapid change that eventually leaves us in a place which is in some sense unrecognizable from where we were. And going back to what we talked about in terms of the, um, you know, putting someone in charge, um, uh, a few years ago people were talking about leaderless organizations as somehow incomprehensible, hmm. and today it's becoming more of uh, something that people accept. In the future, it will be incomprehensible that people thought about putting someone in charge of a complex so organization. So how does that work? Is it because, at a local level? The people that are dealing with the problems they are facing them every day are much in a better position to come up with the solutions and solve them themselves rather than going up to the hierarchy and back again through five or six layers of decision making. Like no. the hypothesis in the past was there's a few people that have the right information to make decisions and right. now because the information is decentralized where lo people that are dealing with their local level are much yeah. more entitled. So what's the... So there's. What you're saying is correct, that people locally have the right information, but it's, it's more than that. It's that they together interactively have the ability to respond. We have to think about them not as individuals responding to information, but as how they interact with each other in order to respond to what's going on. Um, and that can happen at all scales also, at the large scale as well. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the other part of of what you've been talking about is that people have a hard time knowing how to connect decisions to outcomes. Mm -hmm. the, there is a, an opacity, a, there is a, a, like a fog that it's hard to see past. Mm -hmm. So people don't know whether what the consequences of a particular action will be. And so how is a policymaker going to know how to do? And, and then you may end up getting having other kinds of motivations. But the point is that ideological frames that simplify one's understanding of the world are not effective in responding to the world. So um, one has to go past ideological frames and recognize not only that ideological frames are not useful, um, that there is need for one of two things, either much deeper sophistication in the analysis mm -hmm. and that can help so that if we have sort of large scale decisions that are being made like how to respond to the uh, pandemic that's the the coronavirus pandemic or how to respond to a financial crisis or um, other kinds of sort of collectively large scale things you still have to take into account all of the unintended consequences, the indirect effects of things uh, bouncing against each other that you might not think about if you think about it in a linear, you know, if I push on it this way, it's going to have this effect. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is indeed when it becomes uh, much more complex than even a highly sophisticated analysis will not answer the need uh, of understanding and we really have to have the complexity of human understanding but not an individual, multiple people working together. 
Um, and in some sense, this was the idea behind checks and balances, right? It was distributed control. Of course, we're losing checks and balances in governance today, but we need a much greater collaborative decision-making process to deal with the highly complex problems that we're facing. And, and do you think, um, again, you said it's more of a societal change than a technology change, but what do you think uh, show the biggest um, potential in allowing us to make that transition right now in terms of maybe technologies or things, initiatives, actions it's, it's, that we could do? The main thing is learning how to collaborate with people that don't think the same way as you do or don't have the same skills. It's complementarity in collaboration that enables us to really advance our ability to address the challenges that we're facing today. Yeah, and you have an article in Medium about this um, called Teams Manifesto. And one of uh, the things, uh, I just came from a meeting uh, with a psychologist, a personality psychologist, and he, w he kept talking to me about, well, if you're high in conscientiousness and you're orderly, you need to work with this type of person and if this like, and he kept talking about all those things and he said that to me that the challenge is figuring out where to, if you have 10 things that you want a group of people to do, um, he said that the challenge is figuring out exactly where to stop this person and have that person continue and, uh, and he talked about um, the farther away you go from your strengths of your personality, which in some sense they're biologically bounded, the harder it is, the more effort it takes for you to do something. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to have somebody else. Exactly. Um, so you, that's really the, str yeah. the, the, the point. There are personality differences, there are also knowledge differences and so on. And the complementarity of these different things is what enables one to do things together. But knowing how mm. to work together is itself a challenge. And the solution to that is we have to learn how to do that. It's not something that we know already. It's something that we have to develop our abilities in. Okay. So talking but, about... Uh, go ahead. By the way, one of the things that's happening, ironically, is that many organizations are still seeking the traditional view. So they're making themselves worse and worse at decision making at a time where they need to transform. So the, that is what makes it a sharp transition rather than a smooth transition. Because as organizations become more and more limited in their ability to do effective decision making by putting people in charge, by centralizing, we need new organizations to arise that will implement uh, more distributed processes. Uh, you think that's because, and, and then we'll go to the next topic, but you think that's because people have such an ingrained desire for control and power that it's in order for them to start making that transition you're, you're, you're suggesting, they need to change their mindset, which in and of itself would make what they're doing not feasible anymore. Right. So Right. In other words, you have a solution that looks like a good solution, so you try to emulate it. And indeed, it has to do a little bit of you know, self-importance and arrogance as opposed to humility and ability to collaborate. So it's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a frame of mind transition um, that is uh, a, a functional and a behavioral and in many different ways really brings us into a different space. Okay, so if I'm somebody leading an organization or somebody in a position to actually do things differently, what are a couple of things I could do uh, that, would, that would get me in this direction and would, will allow me to better understand the pros and cons of the current way and uh, different ways of approaching? I, I do think that people often that are in charge of organizations understand and have understood for decades that, that you know, if they're the only decision maker, that the system is in trouble, right? The organizations are changing. Um, it is um, somehow learning how to take steps in the right direction, learning how to work with other people in a way that's more and more collaborative and learning to respect other people in their domains of expertise. And it's a challenge because respecting someone else in their domains of expertise when you don't have it is hard because you don't know how to evaluate it. So there are built-in challenges to doing this, but that's what we have to overcome. Did nature solve this? Because there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of evolutionary parallels in, in your work and, and everything, and it seems like evolution is one of the, well, one of the best mechanisms we have. Do other, way, other 
organisms or ways of organization have figured this out, like ants or things, things of that nature? Did they figure out how to do this? So uh, ants and flocks and stuff like that have relatively simple collective behaviors. Um, the easiest analogies are actually organismal. So mm -hmm. thinking about sort of cells in a body and how they collaborate with each other without having like the cells of the brain, without having one cell in charge is a better way of thinking about what's happening today. Okay. So what are a couple of, uh, we were talking about coronavirus, and that's something uh, that m maybe you can elaborate on. Uh, let's start with that. Can you uh, briefly explain um, what's your uh, current understanding of the coronavirus that's currently everybody's, uh, well, uh, freaking out, let's say, about? What well, coronavirus is, is the most recent current a sort of major global pandemic risk that could kill many, many people. And if it becomes more deadly, which it might, uh, through additional mutations, it, it could be tremendously devastating. Even at the current level, if you imagine, you know, a few percent of the people population of the world dying, it would be hugely disastrous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and in addition to causing, you know, economic you know, the, the death is the, the disruption and, and everything else that would accompany it. Um, the, um, the first challenge is making sure people understand the extent of the harm that it can cause. Because what people tend to do, and this is true in public health as it is in other arenas, is they tend to think in terms of past experience and they not necessarily understand that in the case of uh, where you have extreme events, past experience is not a good indicator of future events. So you can have much, much larger events than you've seen ever before. And so that's just a basic understanding of risk. There are two reasons why events are, are surprisingly large. One is just the fact that there is what's called a fat tail distribution, meaning that you have a low probability, but still a significant probability of much larger events. The other reason is because the distribution itself is changed and changing because of the uh, increase in connectivity of the world. And it's bringing us close. So we've, we have a research that shows that we're close to a transition point, which would be a transition to extinction, right? Because there is a point beyond which if we have enough transportation, there is no way we can stop a super deadly pathogen from spreading all over the world and killing everybody. So mm. we, are, we are somewhere close to that transition and the fact that pandemics can be larger and larger is an indication of proximity to that transition. So one is to understand the risk. The other is to actually understand that we can do something about it. And there is a standard uh, perspective in public health which says, once you have a pandemic, there's nothing you can do to stop it. But part of the reason that they believe that there's nothing you can do to stop it is that they are not um, considering, quote, extraordinary actions. Actions that change human behavior, that change transportation in the world. Mm -hmm. and they're, they're assuming that the society, normally when you treat a patient, you don't change the society in order to treat the patient. But in extreme circumstances, you have to change the society in order to be able to respond to extreme events. And there is a, there is a, um, a way of understanding what changes are needed when you treat a patient who is sick. There are two things that you do. One is that you treat them, you care for them, you provide them with a care for them to get better. But the other one is that you prevent them from infecting others. You put them in isolation. Um, when we have a larger uh, contagion, we cannot do it just at the level of individuals. So we have to do it at multiple scales. And this is one of the fundamental concepts of complex systems. You treat, in this case, the way it manifests is you treat at the community level or at the urban level. So again, you apply the same principle. You provide care for the community, but you also prevent the contagion from the community. And physicians, and reasonably so because they have experience with patients and not with communities, they don't feel comfortable imposing 
constraints or travel constraints on communities, they're worried about unintended consequences. And that makes sense. You don't want people to be afraid that you're going to uh, make a moat around them and, and lock the door and walk away. But it's the opposite. What you want to do is provide the care to the community, but also prevent the contagion. And this is now what's happening in China. They've been making isolation of, of entire cities or of communities in order to prevent the contagion. And this is really what needs to be done and to be understood as a proactive response to an extreme event. An extreme event like this is something that grows exponentially. If you don't get ahead of it, you'll never stop it. So you have to act quickly, excessively even, in order to stop it. Then you can pull back as things become uh, under control. And because uh, I was thinking when you were saying that we had pandemics in the past, some of them almost wiping out the entire human race, and we were definitely not, by any stretch of the imagination, as connected as now. Right. So what you're saying is because now we're so connected, the speed... The at time which scale at which things happen is very rapid, hmm. and the extent of the spread is a clearly very rapid. And, and again, these, these events happen uh, rarely enough that they're... The, the, one of the properties of pathogens is that they evolve to non-lethality rather than lethality. Because if they kill us, then they die too. But that only works if you have local extinctions. If mm -hmm. you have global extinctions, they don't have a chance to learn. So in a globally connected world, it's actually the most virulent, most deadly pathogens that become the dominant ones. And mm -hmm. that's why you have a transition to extinction, actually. So we are now having emergence of newer, more deadly pathogens coming from contagion from animal sources. And we have to now uh, uh, be able to respond to this. And there may be some things that we have to do that reduce our vulnerability. That's one of the keys. Um, and if we don't take it seriously enough, we won't be doing those. And how can we, how can we take it more seriously? Because as you've said, we can't really learn from the past because we haven't had an extension before <laughs> so right. there's not much you can learn there and well we didn't have that many tools to capture data in the past let's say um, large-scale diseases that happen so how what are some ways that people can uh, you describe some but are there any other things people can do well the, the fundamental yeah. statement is that complexity science is about understanding the effect of dependencies so we don't have to experience a super large pandemic in we order to... We can simulate it. We can simulate it. We can understand it from the basic properties of the, uh, of the contagion and of the, of the properties of the pathogen as well as the properties of the society. Yeah. And when I was, when I was thinking of this and... Me, go ahead. But by the way, this is really what science is for. It's so that we don't have to do everything as, a, as an autonomy, as a, as a different thing, we can learn how to generalize, right? When Newton studied gravity, he hadn't been to the moon, but he could generalize what gravity does to the moon from what understanding of gravity does in general. So it's the ability to generalize that is the power of science. So hmm. rather than thinking about every event as being a new event, we learn the principles, and that is what enables us to anticipate or to project ourselves into new circumstances and then to address uh, whether problems or opportunities that arise there. Okay. So what are some of the other uh, topics that uh, you're doing a lot of research on that uh, we, can, uh, we can talk about uh, so people can understand the application of of complex systems on those uh, problems. So looking back, you know, when there was the financial crisis, um, not long after the financial crisis, the Arab Spring happened. Yeah. And one of the research projects that we were involved in showed that uh, the two were linked. Um, and mm. there was linkage to other property, other things that were happening. So the Arab Spring was actually triggered by increasing food prices that created desperation in the society. People couldn't feed their families. And 
even though it happened a number of years after the financial crisis, the reason w that it happened had to do with the fact that money that left the mortgage markets and the stock markets during the crash moved into commodities market, and that movement sh drove up the commodity prices and um, created the uh, context for the Arab Spring eventually. Mm. But that wouldn't have been possible unless the commodity markets had been deregulated. And that happened in 1999-2000, which was seven years before the financial crisis. And one other thing, which is that people started burning corn as part of gasoline, which is the ethanol, 10% of the gasoline in our cars is actually coming from corn hmm. in the form of alcohol, ethanol, that is from fermented corn. And that was a government regulation that caused that. So we have the ethanol regulations, we have the deregulations of the commodity markets, and we have the financial crisis combining to create the conditions for the Arab Spring, which then led to social disruption in Syria, for example, among other countries, which led to the growth of ISIS, the opportunity for ISIS to grow, which led to the European refugee crisis, m many of which came from Syria. So we have this global cascade of social and economic factors um, that we can uh, understand using complexity science. And uh, can you uh, maybe walk into a little bit more into some of the other uh, fundamental principles of complexity science uh, so that people can start using those to apply it to the other, other problems. And that's especially, um, I don't know if you, you think, if you think the same, but it looks like the next 15, 20 years m looks like it has, we need to figure out how to deal with these problems, otherwise right. they might overwhelm us in, a, in an incomprehensible way. Yeah. Um, do you think that's accurate? Uh, absolutely. We are either we learn how to deal with our own complexity, or we will not be successful. But um, to tell you now all of the principles of complex systems, it's a very deep field, and maybe it would be better for if I to refer them to for people to a, a, a book and, and uh, courses that they might be interested yep. in taking. We will uh, we will have a link to, and people can can look at those. But we will have a link to your books the courses that you have, and also you have a, uh, one that I've read, a uh, research paper, kind of walking through the introduction. Yes, of, uh, so there's a paper, there are a couple of papers. There is a new paper introducing the uh, introduction to complexity yep. science and its applications. And there's another paper called Why Complexity is Different. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in terms of the societal change that we're talking about, there's a paper called Complexity Rising, Mm -hmm. which uh, people can find online. And you mentioned the uh, paper uh, Teams, a manifesto, and there are a few yep. other short pieces about teams explaining why teams are necessary uh, to address complexity. Yeah, and we're definitely going to have links on that. Do you think on the, uh, on the teams and overall how would people organize themselves, do you think that's, that might be a meta problem that if solved will then solve all the other ones? Uh, do, you, do you look at it kind of like a causal problem if, if it gets figured out, then people will be able to then... Yeah, Teams is definitely a meta problem. And there's an other meta problem, which is the analytic capabilities. Mm. In other words, the, one is that there are some things that we can analyze, understand, and, and better characterize. And those are powerful tools that we should use. And on mm -hmm. the other side is how we create our own abilities as a society. Uh, to address the uh, complexity of what we're facing, which is, uh, in, in a word, teams. But it, one clarification is that it teams on multiple scales, which means there are interpersonal teams, but there also are teams all the way up to the size of the world as a whole. Yeah, and in those fields, does it look like we, as, a human, as human beings, we, we have should we increase our ability, our actual ability to deal with complexity? Or is that a losing game and we might as well find ways so that we don't have to deal with so much complexity? Because it seems like what you're proposing and from your article about teams, you're, you're, it's, a, it's a way f 
for um, if if you distribute uh, the systems in the in that way, people won't have to, well, especially people at the right. top, won't have to deal with so much complexity. You actually, so you you're not reducing the complexity at a whole. You're just dealing. You're just distributing in a way that's manageable to individuals. Right, but in a sense. What we're reducing is the complexity that an individual has to deal with, but not that society as a whole has to deal with. And that's the solution. That's because the we, solution. as a biologically bounded mechanism, I don't really see a way, I'm not aware of any, that we can 300x our ability to, for input Correct. information or processing Correct. information, all those things. So Correct. we're not basing ourselves on that. We're that's basing right. how we can reorganize, that's considering right. what we have, that's right. not improvement, how we can do that. That's right. That's okay. exactly right. Okay, so um, w w one one other example um, uh, I would like to talk about, and then I'll have um, an additional question. I'll, I'll let you go. But I was looking at this article about, that you wrote about ethnic violence, and y your research um, suggested that the cause f for that, and it was not an obvious one. Um, so can you elaborate a bit on that? Sure. Um, so. Our analysis shows that um, it's really the geography of the communities that uh, is the critical factor uh, in causing ethnic violence. So people think that there are, you know, antagonisms between groups, or that there are historical factors, or maybe economic factors, or grievances, or other things, power, um, and so on. But our analysis shows that the first factor that one should be aware of is actually just how groups are present geographically. Hmm. So if people are mixed in the same neighborhood, they don't fight each other. If people are well separated, so they have very large areas for each of, each of the groups, they don't fight each other, they don't see each other. But if people have a patch of about 20 kilometers, so sort of a distance that you might walk in a day, a neighborhood size kind of, then people fight each other. Hmm. And one way to understand this is that when people know each other, they're not going to be fighting each other. But at that patch size, people begin to want to impose their values on the public space. And the others that are coming through are, are interfering with that, and that creates friction. And that causes the violence. And the patch sizes can arise for a number of reasons. They can arise because of um, the fact that people um, prefer to live with others of the same type. Uh, it may not have antagonistic aspects to it, but just the patch size itself then creates the antagonism that uh, causes violence. Um, so that's the, the framework of when and how violence takes place, at least in many different parts of the world. Um, the key question then is how do you prevent it? And there are three possibilities, it turns out. One is that you mix people. And this happens in Singapore. There's housing blocks that have a certain percentage of each ethnic group. And at one point on the website, I don't know if it's there now, they said explicitly this is in order to prevent sectarianism. And indeed, I also visited there, and they are very clear that this is the understanding of why you want there to be mixed housing So it's a regulation that certain percentages. That's right. It's re yeah. regulation. The uh, other possibility is to separate. But you have to separate at a larger scale than 20 kilometers, right, which is not always understood. Um, so, for example, um, uh, right, the uh, Greece and Turkey were fighting each other for many years. Sometime in the last century, they said, "Let's stop this," and each sent the other one, its citizens, you know, the, the respective uh, citizens, if you will, or, or cultural uh, people, and they stopped fighting each other. So that's a second option. It turns out that there is a third option, which is just to provide sufficient local autonomy. So, for example, Switzerland has cantons. And there are mountains and lakes that separate the languages, the three different dominant languages of Switzerland. And by and large, people don't fight each other except for one place where the mountain range isn't steep enough and they do fight each other at that place. So the point is that sufficient separation 
can actually prevent violence. And local autonomy, political autonomy, um, may be enough in many cases to prevent violence, as long as the boundaries are aligned with where the location of the ethnic groups are. Mm -hmm. Now, there's all kinds of concerns about separation, but this is a response to separation. It doesn't mean that you impose the separation. Yeah. If the separation exists naturally, then one can respond to it by creating uh, autonomy that enables people to make local decisions. Yeah. Um, so that's also, by the way, an approach. Some more localism is, more, is also an approach to the fact that local groups are diverging from each other uh, in, in globally. And because of that divergence, there is more imperative to give local autonomy in decision making so that people don't get into conflict about A forcing B or B forcing A to do something that they don't want yeah. to do. Does that yeah, answer yeah, that your question? Yeah, that makes sense. What, what's interesting to me, one of the things is um, if you would ask those groups that, let's say, if you would take one of those groups and that they're fighting each other, you ask them why, nobody will come up with the realization that they're an effect of the system that they're in. Correct. And, and not, and, and so that's, isn't it, why aren't our brains, well, uh, that's an obvious answer, but why are our brains made up to understand the systems we're in that's rather than just Very being, good question. Yeah. And the answer is because it's not always easy to go to the larger scale. We, we experience the reasons that we as individuals do something, hmm. but we don't see the collective forces that are taking place, at least not obviously. So it's not always so simple. And also there are all these dynamical feedback effects. So there are dynamical effects, there are, there are these larger scale effects that are not visible unless you ask the right question. And really in some sense what complex systems does for us is it enables us to figure out what the right question is. Hmm. And that's often the key to being able to figure out what the yeah. answer is. In like, fact, the question and the answer are yeah. closely related. Would you say the hitchhike, hitchhike Guide to the Galaxy is, because uh, you, you, you ask a question and the answer is 42. So it's, it right. seems like the philosophical presentation of that is once you have the question, That's right. the answer is not the problem. Is That's that on right. the same lines? That's something like that. The yeah. point is that uh, it, it's often very hard to figure out what was the right question to ask. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, Yanir, um, I would like to, um, before we, uh, we, we finish, I would like to uh, ask you if you can give us more detail. We're right now in your office uh, if you, about what uh, Nexi is doing and what are you guys working on, why are you doing what you're doing, and how can people learn more uh, and, and get involved in your, in your work? So um, uh, Nexi is a nonprofit academic research institute, and we are studying um, various global challenges, but also other ones. So we're interested in uh, global, and we've done work all the way down to molecular uh, scale problems. Um, but among the problems that we've been working on recently are understanding a polarization and its effect on elections, mm. um, we, on understanding pandemics, understanding financial crises, um, and um, uh, we've also been very much interested in understanding the social structure of the world, including social fragmentation and how it's developing in a world that is increasingly connected. Um, so there are many different topics that we're very excited to study. And uh, at the same time, we're also uh, working with companies to help them understand the challenges of their environment. And that's both in the private sector as well as in the public sector. So we've looked at healthcare organizations and, uh, and educational, uh, the structure of educational institutions to understand how they can be, um, how they can improve in response to the challenges that we're facing. Um, our, I, I assume that you'll have our website for people to come to find us, and um, uh, we welcome people to participate with us. The challenges are great and there's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, the opportunity really is present because the fundamental understanding of how we do science is being affected by um, 
basically, uh, going back to the last thing that we talked about, yeah. recognizing that the questions that we're asking have to change, that things are not independent, that the dependencies between parts of a system, whether it's people or molecules, is a key part of what we need to understand. Mm. And by focusing on how those dependencies create the behaviors of the system, we can really advance our understanding of what's going on in the world. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for that, ex uh, that explanation. And we're going to have links to all of those things. One extra point, and, and we'll finish the conversation. Do you think that, because um, it, it, it seems to me the psychological shift is the first thing they need to do before they actually start understanding how these things work and, and go along and implement them. Do you, th and looking, for example, if, you are, if you've been in a certain way of organizing yourself for 50 years or 40 years, it, it looks like those incentives have solidified in your psyche sure. and in your way pretty, pretty solidly. Um, do you think this is something that maybe more young people will be much, kind of a, much more able to take like a first principles approach and understand this? Or do you think if you're, let's say, if, you, if you've been in an organization, way of organizing yourself for 30 years, you can still... Uh, get these principles? I think it's possible. I think yeah. it will depend on the individual. But I do think that there is also a generational process that's yeah. happening. And it's a, it's a cultural change. And we see it in, in the way people interact and in the nature of the, um, the cultural manifestations, whether it's movies or TV shows or books. There is a shift from an individually heroic model the archetype yeah. the archetype to a uh, to a teams of individuals the superheroes are becoming teams and not individuals and and really the superhero model is not a bad one in this context because uh, the way superheroes are portrayed is they have a what, what, what is your what do they call it what is your um, uh, what is the quality that you are a superhero at, right? What is your... Your superpower. Superpower, right. Okay, there you go. What is your superpower, right? And so recognizing that different individuals have different superpowers is the beginning of understanding how we can interact with each other to achieve a, a better world. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, and thank you for everybody that's watching. Um, I think you're doing uh, great work and uh, I, I hope that people have gotten enough information so they can go and learn more and start implying these things in whatever various fields they're in and they're interested. So thank you so much. Thank you.